Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Sami Said from uh, uh, the CTSNet. Uh, I'm the congenital uh, senior editor. I have the honor today with um, having uh, Stefan Eldi um, with us, uh, who is an integrated uh, cardiothoracic surgical uh, resident um, at uh, Stanford. And um, it's, uh, uh, this was uh, a presentation he uh, uh, presented in the uh, latest uh, AETS meeting. And um, um, hello, Stefan, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, thanks for uh, being uh, here today. Um, uh, if you uh, want to tell us a little bit about yourself, your interests, and uh, what made you choose cardiac surgery um, to, to start with? Certainly. So um, I went to the University of Minnesota Medical School and uh, pretty early on, realized I was interested in a surgical specialty and what really drew me to cardiac surgery in, in particular was that we're, we really have the opportunity to re-engineer the heart with almost every operation we do um, as opposed to removing pathology. So the opportunity to rebuild something that was uh, sort of naturally engineered um, in such a magnificent way uh, was a really appealing specialty. And also you know, my, my medical school years were kind of in the backdrop of uh, C. Walton Lillehigh and Norman Shumway's legacy at the University of Minnesota. Um, and so Sarah Shumway was one of my mentors, and um, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work very closely with her and Gabriel Lohr. They were phenomenal mentors that helped me get my foot in the door into the OR and um, learn how to do some clinical research and really set me on the path to um, having the chance to train at Stanford. Excellent. Um, and there's a lot of history there. You know, I was uh, part of the University of Minnesota at some point, so I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so what what year are you in now in your training? Yeah, so I finished three clinical years and I'm doing three years in the laboratory. Uh, I've completed two of those three. So one year left in the lab and then I'll return to service as a PGY4. Excellent. Uh, have you? Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm. I can guess, but have you decided uh, what subspeciality in cardiac uh, that you hope to join? Yes, I'm very interested in transplant surgery. Um, also interested in potentially trying to pursue um, an elective practice in mitral valve surgery. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, uh, in the latest AATS meeting, you had a, a very interesting uh, presentation uh, about beating heart transplant. Um, why um, don't you tell us a little bit about it and the idea of uh, beating heart transplant? Certainly. So, um, Dr. Joseph Wu, our chairman, um, he had this idea. You know, we all know that the the um, rate of mechanical circulatory support after uh, DCD transplants using uh, ex vivo perfusion systems, the, the rate of mechanical circulatory support is rather high. We had been talking amongst ourselves and discussing why that may be. And we, we kind of wondered if uh, the ischemia reperfusion injury uh, may be playing a role to it. We know that's very detrimental in um, the context of STEMIs. Um, and so he had the innovative idea instead of arresting the heart at the end of a uh, transmedics run uh, for a DCD donor, uh, why not just implant it while beating? And so um, we tried that and it went flawlessly. We of course had a backup plan, making sure that if there were any um, unexpected events that we had a cardioplegia cannula in ready to arrest the heart and then proceed in the traditional fashion. And so we felt safe to proceed. Um, we've now done close to 30 beating heart implantations. And last I heard, there are at least seven other institutions around the world who have also started performing these procedures. And with the um, phenomenal success of that procedure, which my good friend and colleague Arvind Krishnan also presented at AATS, um, we started to wonder if we couldn't apply this to brain dead donors as well, because that, prevent, that pre uh, presents the opportunity to also procure it beating and then implant it beating so that it's uh, continuously perfused between donor and recipient, never misses a beat, eliminates ischemia and eliminates ischemia reperfusion injury. So that's what we wanted to study in the lab. Uh, we originally were attempting uh, beating heart explants in a sheep model. We eventually transitioned to pigs because the sheep aorta is uh, quite short. 
And mm -hmm. it's just technically challenging to have enough room to fit the cross clamp in the donor, as well as the uh, root vent that we provide the anti-grade perfusion through. And so we ended up having to sew on the nominate artery grafts so that we had enough length to perfuse the sheep. So uh, it turns out the pigs were much more technically feasible. And once we did some proof of concept work, um, we proceeded with what we now call total beating heart transplantation. So beating explant, uh, place it on ex vivo perfusion, which is a, a circuit built by uh, my colleague Moeed Fawad uh, in Dr. Brandon Genhart's lab, transition it off of the ex vivo perfusion circuit. Uh, at that point, it's supplied by the cardiopulmonary bypass, the recipient's cardiopulmonary bypass circuit and sew it in while it's beating. So it will be a non-stop heart transplant. Exactly. So in, in your presentation, uh, you basically described the, the three strategies or the three techniques, which is the static cold, the traditional ex vivo, and the total beating heart. Uh, if you can explain the, the differences uh, to the uh, audience and the viewers and outcomes of these three different strategies, uh, it would be helpful. Absolutely. So uh, starting with the static cold storage group, um, these patients uh, are most similar to a brain dead donor. Um, where, uh, or these, this experimental arm is most similar to, uh, the brain dead scenario where, uh, you can under controlled conditions, arrest the heart properly with cardioplegia or UW, um, ice it and explant it. So then the only ischemic period is the cold ischemic period. And then the brief warm ischemic period while you're actually implanting the heart. Um, so one ischemic period and one ischemia reperfusion, um, episode, um, we also wanted to compare it to, uh, traditional ex vivo heart perfusion. So in this case, uh, there are two periods of ischemia, both before it's reanimated on the ex vivo circuit. Um, and then when it's rearrested, uh, before implant. So two episodes of ischemia and two episodes of ischemia reperfusion injury. So we thought comparing these two groups to the beating heart transplant technique, would provide a lot of informative data on whether or not there's a graded response to ischemia reperfusion injury, being that beating heart has zero, uh, static cold storage has one, and then the traditional EVHP arm has two. So the results that we found, um, we did a wide variety of assays. We looked at uh, left ventricular function. We looked at transcriptomic changes using single nuclei RNA sequencing, traditional lab methods, Western blot immunohistochemistry. And what we really found is that um, when you eliminate ischemia reperfusion and ischemic injury, um, there's better myocardial viability, so less cell death. There's improved ventricular systolic function and uh, improved compliance of the left ventricle. In the static cold storage group, which like I mentioned, is only exposed to one instance of ischemia reperfusion injury, uh, a lot of these results comparing static cold to the traditional EVHP were not statistically significant. We have to do more runs, but there was a definite trend toward the static cold storage group performing slightly better in many of our assays than the uh, traditional EVHP group. We hypothesized that that's a result of uh, fewer ischemia reperfusion injuries. Uh, I mean, obviously it makes sense. And uh, we, we try even in, in non-transplant heart surgery uh, to perform a lot of the operations with obviously minimal ischemic time is better, or if we can avoid the cross clamp is, is good. And uh, we've done some, uh, you know, a lot of cases in the pediatric and a congenital world as well um, with the same idea. Um, so you, you said that you, you used the several ways to assist the ischemia reperfusion injury mm -hmm. in, the, in the myocardium. Um, and, and you mentioned some examples of that uh, already. Um, when, when we take this to um, the um, clinical uh, world, um, how how do you see the feasibility of of doing this? Because the the probably some challenges also technical as you do that with the beating heart, and uh, I can imagine that sometimes it can be challenging even in a smaller size heart of the pediatric hearts. So the idea is good, and um, it's the applicability of of it um, in all cases, selective cases. What do you think? 
Yeah, we've completely transitioned uh, to the beating heart implantation clinically. So every DCD donor so far since we started doing it is now undergoing uh, beating heart implantation. All of our transplant surgeons have performed it. Like I mentioned, other centers are doing it too. We fully understand that it is intimidating uh, when, when a center is just beginning to do it. But um, my co-resident Arvind Krishnan and I, um, we we're throwing every stitch on these transplants, you know, and we only have three years of, of residency under our belts. And so um, with proper planning and uh, making sure that you have a safe and reliable backup plan, which is as simple as inserting a cardioplegic cannula or a, a wide root vent so that you can, um, if needed, arrest the heart if anything were to happen. I think it's technically feasible for most institutions that do a high volume of heart transplants to begin with. Hmm. I mean, one, one big advantage is there's no rush, you know, that right. you you have you have plenty of time to perfect your anastomosis and and finish with with no with no issues that's exactly right and and same in the explant too you can make sure your cuffs are an appropriate length you can negotiate with the lung team for as long as you want because the heart's perfused there's no pressure to get it out uh, as quickly as we would in normal circumstances so what would be your next step now in in your research we need to do a survival study um, a lot of the really exciting data that we found demonstrate, it seemed to suggest that when there is ischemia reperfusion injury, it activates the innate immune system. And of course, the innate immune system then primes the adaptive immune system, which we believe may predispose patients to rejection. But we can't be certain about that until we can survive these pigs longer term. Survival in the, in the pigs presents its own set of unique challenges. Really difficult for a 70 kilogram uh, pig to heal a sternotomy. Uh, there's also the issue of blood transfusions, making sure that the, tran the transfused blood is uh, similar enough to the recipient that it's not going to confound our inflammatory assays um, and sort of lead us astray. But that's one of the next steps. And even more broadly, we're just very interested in organ preservation, uh, rehabilitation, and we're also looking at some pretty innovative ways of um, mitigating ischemic insult in uh, the context of ischemic heart disease. So non-transplant applications uh, of a similar vein of research. This is really, um, you know, groundbreaking and uh, it's very exciting as well to, to change and shift the, the, the practice into something, um, you know, hopefully will be better on the long term for patients. Mm. So um, congratulations on, on your presentations and, you, and your work. And uh, is there anything else? Um, you mentioned you want to be um, involved more in the heart transplant in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking to do additional training after you finish or um, you're just going to go to practice? I, I do plan to do additional training. Um, many of our graduates of our I6 program finish with 50 to 70 heart transplants as the primary surgeon under their belt. They're on the right side of the table for those. However, um, I think I think the transplant fellowship is definitely something that I'm interested in. And then longer term, we're really set up pretty uniquely here at Stanford. The way that Dr. Wu has built the program, we leave with not only an excellent technical um, training experience, but also um, with the robust research community here at Stanford that we're surrounded by. It's really a launching pad for us to uh, all trainees of this program to uh, become independent NIH funded uh, surgeon scientists. So that's my long term goal, become a surgeon scientist at a high volume academic cardiac surgery program. Uh, this is fantastic and uh, I wish you the best and uh, I'm sure we will hear a lot of great things in the future uh, regarding your work and uh, your, your program. Um, so uh, it was a uh, great uh, to have you with us today and uh, thank you for uh, your presentation and your excellent work. Good luck. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed.